with my PhD students, Vivek Borua Thapa and Trisha Sharkar. So the first question comes, sorry, the uh, slide is not removing. Just press click somewhere, just click. Uh, just click somewhere in the presentation and then try. Yeah, just click somewhere. Yeah, now it's okay. Good. Okay, sorry, thank you. So the first question comes, what is the relation between neutron star and the nuclear sensation? The electrons are pushed into the um, uh, nuclei and inside the nuclei, they combine with the protons to form neutron. So that is why the nuclei becomes neutron rich. And with the increase in density, when density reaches 10 to the power 11 gram per cc, the neutrons drip out of the neutron rich nuclei. Thus the matter inside the collapsed core is composed of free neutrons with small admixture of protons and electrons. Then the neutron degeneracy pressure balances the gravitational force and form neutron star. So this is the uh, form, this is the process of formation of neutron star, and the average density of matter inside the neutron star is a few times the normal nuclear matter density. Inside neutron star, the density increases gradually from surface to core, with increase in density towards core. Near the core, the heavier strange and non-strange variants may appear. And matter proper, but matter properties at that much high density is not well understood because of the difficulty to produce this kind of matter in terrestrial laboratory. So one way to understand this kind of matter from laboratory experiment is to extrapolate the nuclear matter properties to dense matter. But in that extrapolation, it should be kept in mind that this uh, dense matter inside neutron stars is highly asymmetric. So symmetry energy of nuclear matter and its behavior with density uh, have crucial role to determine the dense matter properties. However, unless very recent uh, estimate of symmetry energy and its slope by nuclear experimental data PREX2, the nuclear symmetry energy is not well constant by nuclear data. So one way is to get the good constant on the symmetry energy and its slope with density from neutron star observations. And the other way is to study the neutron star properties with the recently obtained data from nuclear physics experiments. So for this, we use covariant density functional model for matter composed of variants. In this model, the variants interact among themselves via the mesons and the mediator mesons are isoscalar, scalar meson sigma and sigma star in this model, and isoscalar uh, vector meson omega phi and isovector vector meson rho. And here the symbol B includes members of baryon octet and the uh, symbol D that, in, that denotes the delta res resonances. And the baryon meson interaction is, uh, is estimated by the symbol G that means G sigma B, G sigma star B, etc. And the model parameters are determined in such a way that the model can reproduce the matter properties at nuclear saturation density. So from this model to produce the proper compressibility of matter at nuclear saturation density, either self-interaction of sigma mesons uh, should be incorporated or the baryon meson interaction should be density dependent. So if the nonlinear self-interaction of sigma mesons are included, then the model is known as nonlinear model. And if the uh, interaction between baryons and mesons are density dependent, then it is known as the density dependent model or TD model in short. And um, Already I have stated that uh, the, uh, uh, all the parameters in this model, and that is why that the um, coupling constants also are determined to reproduce the uh, 
nuclear matter property at saturation density. And the in this Lagrangian, the coupling between nucleons and the isovector meson rho is important for the isotopic asymmetric nature of the matter. That means that the choice of G rho B or G rho N, N for nuclear. The coupling between nucleons and the isovector rho meson determines the relative abundances of protons and neutrons and also the symmetric energy of the matter at nuclear saturation density. And to get the specific density uh, variation of symmetric energy, the density dependence of this coupling parameter is required. So to get the um, already experimentally obtained uh, range of symmetry energy and its density dependence. We consider this, this coupling parameter G rho n density dependent even in nonlinear model with the form like this. Here at any density n, the G rho n, the coupling parameter, coupling yeah. constant between nucleons and rho mesons are given by this expression where we have two parameters. So one parameter is the value of interaction at nuclear saturation density N0. And another parameter is coming in the exponential factor, that is the A rho. And here X is the density of the matter in terms of, in terms of the nuclear saturation density. So we tune these parameters uh, parameters to get uh, the experimentally obtained range of symmetric energy and its slope with density. And for other parameters of the model, we stick to the existing parameterizations with GM1 in nonlinear scheme and with the DDMEX under density dependent scheme. Then we examine, so after tuning these uh, parameters, zero when, to reproduce the experimentally obtained symmetric energy and its slope, we examine the tuned parameterization with the recent astrophysical data from observations of neutron stars. So first we compare the existing equation of state for uh, with the so far obtained values of symmetric energy EC in nuclear symmetric energy EC. So in this plot, the green shaded region uh, indicates the variation of ECM at the subnuclear density from the heavy angulation data. And so far, existing range of ECM, that is the uh, nuclear symmetry energy at nuclear saturation density, is shown by the red particle line. So, obviously, the uh, existing parameterizations of equation of states are fashioned in such a way that it reproduces the ECM at nuclear saturation density. However, all of them do not satisfy well the range of ECM in subnuclear density. The existing nonlinear parameterizations with high LCM, 89 to 93, satisfy the subnuclear density range, but the so far existing maximum value of LCM is 86 MeV. So the existing equation of states with the existing parameterizations are not well compatible with the experimental data for ECM. So we study the density dependence of ECM at subnuclear density with uh, different values of LCM by tuning the parameters in the Coupling, uh, coupling, const, coupling parameters of nucleons and um, mesons, isovector mesons rho. So we see that after tuning, we see that the value of LCM, the minimum value of LCM is 50 MeV to satisfy the density variation of ECM with both the schemes, right? Um, and with this tuning of G rho n, the parameters, the equation parameter, parameters 
the equation of all the equation of state also satisfy the range of ECM at two times nuclear saturation density, which is obtained from the neutron star observations and heavy ion collision experiment. So, in our in in this work, we have tuned the equation of state parameters to reproduce the experimentally obtained values of ECM and LCM. And these parameters of density dependent coupling constant, zero n, which uh, is uh, varies with the density for the different, this is the uh, variation of zero n with density, which gives the uh, experimentally obtained values of EC and LCM for different LCM values, right? Now, we examine the compatibility of the equations of state with recent astrophysical data. The matter pressure range at two times nuclear saturation density has been obtained recently from GW170817 observations. And that is shown by green vertical line in this plot. So we see that if we consider the matter is composed of only nucleons, the left panel, then the constraint is well satisfied with the nonlinear GMO1 equation of state, but marginally satisfied with the density dependent parameterizations. That means that the, with density dependent parameterizations, the nucleonic matter is different with the admissible range of LC than the matter expected from the GW observations. But if we include the heavier strange and non strange variants, the middle and right panel, then the matter gets soft, soft and they satisfy the pressure range at two times nuclear saturation density for both the parameterizations. And also we see that for larger values of LCM, the matter becomes stiff. So this is the <clears throat> Um, constant on the um, LCM or matter matter properties from the astrophysical observations. However, inclusion of heavier variants makes the matter so soft that with nonlinear parameterizations, the upper panel, upper mid and uh, right panel, the matter satisfies marginally the lower bound of maximum mass stars. And other astrophysical observations, that is uh, what is um, shown here um, of, of mass radius measurement that are satisfied by them in entire range of LCM. Hence the matter with exotic degrees of freedom with DD scheme is more compatible with the recent nuclear physics experimental data as well as astrophysical data. And another option is the nucleonic pattern with NL scheme, nonlinear scheme. Now let us consider the constant of tidal deformability of typical 1.4 solar mass star from the GW170817 observations. There are two estimates of 1.4 solar mass star tidal deformability so far. In the plots, they are uh, shown by yellow and green, green vertical line. So in this plot, this, the, these curves are the variation of tidal deformability with the star mass. So it is seen that within the admissible range of LCM, the equation substrate with both the parameterizations containing only nucleons is too stiff to come under the upper limit of tidal deformability by the recent estimate. Recent estimate is the green line. However, inclusion of heavier variants softens the matter and then they come under the limit of tidal deformability but still the curve with LCM85 is excluded. 
So from this, we can get the upper limit of, from this up, uh, astrophysical observation, we get the upper limit of LCM as 85 MeV. And previously we have shown that lower limit of LCM is 50 MeV. So from astrophysical observations, we are getting the limit. We can constrain the values of LCM. Now here we plot the tidal deformability of 1.4 mass, four solar mass star for different values of LCM with different compositions and different parameterizations. For example, the blue curve is for uh, GM nonlinear parameterizations, GM1 with all the uh, variants, strange and non-strange variants. And uh, similarly, uh, the uh, this yellow curve is for DDME experimentations, and the upper curves are with only nucleonic matter that are uh, with different parameterizations. So, and the horizontal lines show the observational upper bound of tidal deformability from two different estimate. So, from this upper bound, it is evident that pure nucleonic matter with uh, density dependent parameterization is too stiff. This is the green one is the nucleonic matter um, curve. And also this curve, this um, figure shows the tight correlation of tidal deformabilities with values of LC. And here also, so from this, what we can predict, we can predict that from this upper bound that for other compositions, that means with delta and hyperons, the if we take the upper limit of lambda 1.4 is 800, then the upper limit of lambda is around 85, of LCM is 85. And if we take the upper bound of lambda 1.4 is 580, then the upper bound of LCM is around 65. For uh, Non, non strange and strange variants matter. And if we take the only the nucleonic matter, then DD, uh, uh, sorry, GM1, uh, GM1 parameterizations gives it is the upper bound of LC as 50 for 580. Then we can compactness, we can estimate the compactness of 1.4 solar mass star from this information that is showing in this figure. If we plot compactness of the 1.4 solar mass star for different values of LCM with uh, different composition and parameterizations, they also show good fit with single parameterizations and specific composition. So from here, we can see that if we take different values of lambda 1 point, upper bound of lambda 1.4, we have different upper bound of L and for that, for suppose we take the upper bound of L as 85, LCM as 85, then we have the minimum uh, lower bound of compactness at 85 as 0.15. Similarly, if we take the upper bound LCM as 65, then we see the lower bound of compactness for 1.4 solar mass star is around 1 point, uh, sorry, 0.154. So from this, we can at least we can uh, infer the uh, lower limit of compactness, and also from uh, astrophysical observation, we can um, we can uh, predict the upper limit of LCM. Now another effect of this ECM and LCM on the nuclear matter is the is on the abundances of different particles. They have significant effect on relative abundances of different isotopic projections of particles. And that we can understand from this figure. In the upper panel, we show the particle fraction with um, original DDME experimentations. And in the lower panel, we show the same uh, particle Monica, fraction. about five minutes more. OK. So we show that it is now with the LCM is equal to 85 MeV 
but with the other parameters are from TDMEX parameterizations. So, and here in the upper panel, the values of LCM is 49.57 MeV. So we see that for the higher values of LCM for 85 MeV, due to higher values of LCM, the delta minus appears later. Consequently, to maintain the charge neutrality, lepton population decreases slowly compared to original DDMEX parameterizations. And because of later appearance of delta, hyperons appear comparatively earlier. And as with the increase in LCM, the appearance of delta occurs later. The decrease in LCM, sorry, increase in LCM stiffens the matter. That what we have seen before. So this is the effect of LCM on the particle abundance. Now, most recent nuclear skin thickness measurement in PREX2 experiment indicates complete different range of ECM and LCM. It indicates entirely different values of ECM at nuclear saturation density, what is shown here by the black vertical line. And the red vertical line is the earlier estimate of ECM. So naturally, the existing parameterizations do not, are not compatible with these recent obtained, recently obtained values of ECM. And to meet this range, ECM and LCM, we calibrate the rho meson coupling parameters for various equation of state like this. So this is the variation of G, two parameters, G rho n and A rho, with density for different existing parameterizations. The new estimated range of ECM and LCM are higher than the so far accepted values no, uh, so far accepted values, and that is why naturally the matter compatible with this new range of ECM and XM will be uh, stiffer compared to the existing parameterization. And consequently, the abundance of different isospin projection will also change, and the proton fraction will increase with larger values of LC. So this is the proton fraction for different equation of states for two different values of LCM I have shown here. This is for LCM 75 MeV and this is for LCM 106 MeV. And the proton fraction is important in context of neutron star cooling. Now the dominating neutron star cooling process is via neutrino emission. And dominating neutrino emission process is direct Turka process. So, uh, and with the existing feasible equation of states, I mean, so far parameterizations of the equation of states, the direct Turka process inside neutron stars is not allowed with the canonical mass star. If the star is very massive, then only Turka can be uh, allowed. But with this new estimate of LCM, as the proton abundance becomes large, the possibility of direct Turka process opens. So we study the variation of uh, threshold density of direct Urka um, uh, process to occur with variation of LC. So here for different equation of states. So here we see that with newly obtained range of LC, the uh, threshold direct direct Turka density is very low. Even if we take it, it is as 85, then it is as low as 1.8 times nuclear saturation density. And this, the lower curve, the lower plot shows the um, uh, threshold neutron star mass with direct Urka allowed process. So with new estimated values of LCM, direct Urka is allowed even in stars with mass as low as 0.7 solar mass. With this data, uh, I mean, with this um, new experimental data of LCM, then even neutron stars with canonical mass 1.4 solar mass show fast cooling because the direct Turka is allowed in this kind of star. 
here we show that theoretical cooling curves for isolated neutron star with masses 1.2 1.4 and 1 and 2 solar mass the uh, blue curve is for two solar mass red for 1.4 and black for 1.2 and the solid curve shows the cooling curve for uh, non superfluid matter and the dashed curve shows for superfluid matter. And so, so, Monica, your time is up, but you can try to quickly summarize. Uh -huh, so that is right. Okay. So, we find that without superfluid suppression, the cooling of even canonical mass neutron stars is too fast to fit the observed cooling features. However, with superfluid suppression, theoretical cooling rate is in good agreement with uh, thermal properties of several neutron stars. So uh, with this new data, our conclusion is that with this new nuclear physics experimental data on LCM, the uh, cooling rate of neutron stars for, for canonical mass star is compatible with the observations. So, in summary, new estimate of nuclear symmetry energy and its density variation is available now. And with this new result, the, uh, we have calculated the uh, new equation of states with the different parameterizations to reproduce the newly obtained experimentally uh, data for LCM and LC. And from astrophysical observations also, we can narrow down the range of LCM. So we obtain the lower limit of LCM as around 50 MeV and the upper limit as around 85 MeV. And uh, the, finally, the conclusion is that that higher values of LCM preferred larger abundance of protons. And that is why that direct Urka is possible even in the um, canonically, canonical mass star, neutron star. And uh, that is why it, it can reproduce the first cooling to match with the observed thermal properties of, the, of many several pulsars. However, it should be noted that if the, with the larger values of LCM, the matter with only nucleons is too stiff to provide upper limit of tidal deformability. And in this connection, um, the matter should be considered with the appearance of heavier variance, especially with delta resonances to make the matter soft. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. So questions, so maybe from the uh, uh, those attending it in li live, so in the, from the auditorium. So any questions from the floor? Uh, are there questions from those attending from Rookie? Okay. Uh, if not, questions from the uh, those who are online? Those who are attending from Zoom, any questions from there? Hello. Can I, I, I don't see any hands from Zoom. So, are, are there is there are there any questions from the uh, from those who are attending from Rurki? Hello? Yes. 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 Please ask. So you showed that the LC mostly the Hausdan the neutron star observations are changed with the LC parameter. So here you have considered the other parameters fixed, like nuclear saturation, and other you have considered particular choice of parameters. So is there be any like this observations will like whatever you have observed, will it change if you vary the other parameters also? Like how can you say that the LCM will be the most dominant in this observation and other because you have kept the other parameters fixed? So will it will this result change if you allow the other parameters to vary also? Yeah, uh, other parameters also affect the different observables of neutron stars. But already, uh, what we have taken, the existing parameterization GM1, DDMEX, that already we have taken with matching uh, matching this equation of state. Um, I mean, uh, we considered this equation, these parameterizations, because they match with the observ uh, so far observations from astrophysics. Other, for other parameters and uh, the particle abundances um, that is that only depend on the values of ECM and LC. And that is not affected by other parameters. 
and stiffness also that softness stiffness that is uh, if, if delta appears delta resonance appears then the metal becomes soft okay any other questions okay so ju just let me add one more point about the history of neutron stars so actually even before bardeen's wiki it was uh, landa who at first proposed a neutron star even before the discovery of the neutron called it a nucleus star Okay, yeah, so uh, just, that is there. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank Monica again for a uh, very nice talk. And uh, so the next talk is by Saurav Singh. So I presume, uh, so Saurav, is it? Are you on, on in Nurki or? or the, uh... Yeah, he, uh, he's here. Okay, okay. So please take it away. So we switch from neutron stars to now cosmology and cosmic dawn. Mm -hmm. The last one. So, Saurav, you have 12 minutes uh, with, uh, and I'll give you a heads up after 10 minutes, okay, once you start. Sure. So I don't see the uh, slides. Yeah. I only see the video. Just a second. Yeah, please take it away, Saurabh. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. So today I will be talking about the latest observations of Ceres and the inference that we have drawn about the cosmic dawn uh, signal that was recently claimed uh, to be detected. Uh, so the key takeaway here is that we are refuting the presence of the flattened profile. Uh, so I think it's. It's fine here. Yeah. Yeah, so we are conclusively refuting the presence of a flattened profile that was uh, claimed to have been detected by this collaboration. And with this finding, we are essentially bringing back the standard cosmological models that were not able to explain uh, the flattened profile that I'll be talking about. This paper is recently out, and I encourage everyone to go and check this out. Uh, before getting into the details, uh, a very quick shout out to all the team members of uh, SARAS that have really made this possible. Um, and with a lot of uh, active support from facilities at Raman Research Institute. And uh, with that, let's just deep dive into what we are doing. So uh, as we have already heard in Avirup's talk, uh, talk in the morning, uh, we are trying to look at the cosmic dawn and above of reionization. And this is the part of the cosmic history when the very first stars and galaxies formed. And the way we are trying to study this is using the 21 centimeter radiation from neutral hydrogen. And we know what the kind of challenges that we face when we try to do such an experiment that ranges from try, trying to tackle the foregrounds from our galaxy and other galaxies, also ionospheric uh, uh, emissions and uh, terrestrial radio frequency interference. But on top of all of that, the most crucial part is how the instrument itself interacts with all of these things. Because in principle, all of these can be separated but if the instrument uh, deals with them in a very frequency dependent way, then the separation between all these contaminations and the actual cosmological signal, this task of separation begins very hard. And just for the dynamic range, the plot on the right, we are showing the foregrounds in blue and the kind of 21 centimeter sig uh, signatures that we expect uh, in colored lines. And so the uh, immediate uh, uh, the aim of this experiment was uh, to confirm this flattened profile. So this was claimed by EGES collaboration in March 2018. And the panel D here shows uh, a flat profile that you are seeing with an amplitude of around 500 millikelvin. And this was claimed to be the signal from the cosmic dawn. And it was pretty robust to all the different choices of analysis and all different choices of hardware configurations. Uh, but of course, this uh, also had its fair share of uh, problems, uh, mostly because it was very anomalous to what we had expected from such an early part of the universe. So the colored lines here show the standard cosmological predictions of what the 21 centimeter signal should look like. 
Of course, the variation in those colored line themselves represents how, uh, uh, how poorly constrained those epochs are. But the signal that turned out from edges collaboration was completely different, both in terms of amplitude, which was roughly twice the maximum amplitude that we had expected, but also with its uh, very fair sharp transitions and uh, the flattening of the signal at the bottom. None of these could have been explained by any standard cosmological model. And in order to explain this, there were several hypotheses floated around that ranged with dark matter interacting with baryons or presence of uh, excess radio background at very high redshift. But all of them had their fair share of problems in tr trying to match other measurement constraints and observations. So at this point, it was very crucial for an experiment to cross verify this claim. And really, from, from the time the results have come out, every experiment around the globe that works in 21 centimeter has been trying to cross verify this. Uh, and that's where Celeste 3 comes in. And this has been an experiment observing uh, uh, around from 2010. And it has gone through a series of evolutions from a, both in terms of antenna changes, calibration strategies, and observing environment. Um, and the, 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 the numbers here basically show the kind of sensitivities that have been achieved post edges results from different experiments. And there are even currently, there are several experiments trying to uh, observe and reach down to better sensitivities. Uh, so coming to Ceres observations, this time we differed from our earlier expeditions in our observing environment. So as you can see, this antenna that operates in 50 to 100 megahertz of, uh, actually floats on water instead of traditional radio telescopes that are installed on ground. And the reason for doing that, uh, there are well multi, uh, multi uh, uh, this uh, justifications of why we want to do this. And the first thing is uh, the way antenna interacts with ground. So in the previous editions of this experiment, what we had seen is antenna is very sensitive to the emission from the ground itself. And if there are stratified profiles in the ground, the systematics that originate are very hard to model unless we have a very precise characterization of what the ground is. And that was an extremely difficult exercise for all the remote locations that we have gone to. So by turning to lake, it was a more uniform uh, uh, conditions of observing. And at the same time, given the properties of water, the efficiency of the antenna itself was enhanced. So for all those reasons, we finally led this deployment at two different sites in Karnataka and observed around 400 hours. And the experiment looks something like this. It's very simple in construction. It has a single antenna that, for, that is followed by analog receiver. And the kind of calibration that we do is what we call a sticky switch radiometer, which is toggling between a standard noise source and the antenna. And 150 meters away from this, we have rest of the electronics. So as you can see, this uh, optical fibers floating on this. So after that uh, optical isolation part, we have got uh, the backend electronics that does the phase switching and cross correlation. And finally, the digital spectrometer that does the Fourier transform and produces the sky spectrum. And of course, with extreme care has been taken in designing each of these components so that the kind of systematics that it produces does not confuse us with the actual 21 centimeter signal that we are looking for. And before deploying, we did a series of lab tests where we replaced the antenna with standard terminations and tried to look at how low can we get in our sensitivities. And we demonstrated both using what we call as maximally smooth functions and also the measurement equation for such an instrument that we were able to get down to the thermal noise and the sensitivity we could, re uh, we could uh, reach in the lab was sufficient to detect the edges like profile that we were trying to cross examine. So the final after deployment and after excessive um, uh, processing in terms of RFI mitigation, in terms of calibration and providing some external corrections, this is the final data that we ended up getting. This is around 15 hours out of the 100 hours that we actually observed. And the question is, and look at the units here, which is several thousands of Kelvin because we are dominated by our foregrounds. The question is that tiny 500 millikelvin signal, does it exist in this data? So the way we model this is by introducing components that represent our understanding of the foregrounds and residual systematics, along with a scaled version of this flat profile. And if the scale factor turns out to be zero or consistent with zero, it basically means that the data doesn't have it. And if it is consistent with unity, it means we are confirming the presence of the flat profile that was seen by edges. And as I said before, the inference that we saw from here is the scale factor turned out to be consistent with zero at 95% significance, and therefore rejecting the presence of any kind of flat profile that had been seen by edges collaboration. And the plot here basically shows the kind of probability distributions and posteriors 
of the final output parameters from our modeling. But this is only one part of it because edges had allowed a range of parameters uh, from their data. So this flat profile itself is described by four parameters, which is the amplitude, the center frequency, full width half max, and the flattening. And we acknowledge uh, their help in sharing these MCMC chains that allowed us to generate signals across the 99% confidence intervals that were allowed by the edges. And we repeated our analysis on all of these signals and ended up actually ruling out the complete parameter space that was allowed by the edges collaboration. And of course, the, the level at which we have ruled these out is very strong function of the amplitude of the signal. Having done that, the second part is what are the kind of errors that we might have? And the way we have quantified this is using the statistical and both systematic errors. So statistical errors are primarily governed by our thermal noise, uh, which is around 40 millikelvin at one megahertz resolution. Then we have systematic errors that can uh, lead to, for example, false detections. And in order to assess that, the question we ask is how critical our results are to different choices of analysis. So for example, if we apply slightly different corrections, or in the extreme case, we don't apply any corrections at all, how much of a scale factor do we change? does it change? And the plot here basically shows the scatter in the scale factor, which basically shows that independent of our analysis choices, we continue to be consistent with zero or absence of a flattened profile. And this all has been taken into account when we code this 95% significance on the rejection. The other question is how sensitive we are to a specific thermal noise realization, right? Because we are averaging all the 15 hours of data to produce a single spectrum. And therefore we split the data into even and odd time samples and also earlier and later parts of the observations. And what we see is for all of those data subsets of the data, we continue to be consistent with zero and basically uh, pointing to absence of the flat profile uh, and even with different thermal noise realizations, which is what you are seeing at the plot here. The next question and the last question that we are asking out of this is the spectral distortions. So the measurement of edges- has Two more minutes. Thank you. So the, the measurement of the edges that is shown here, we know that the flat profile is not a unique solution. Even we had shown some time back that even if you replace flat profile with more systematic like models, you can explain the data equally well. And a lot of model selection algorithms actually prefer such things. So question is that, okay, there is a spectral distortion in the edges data. We don't know what it is. Flat profile could be one of the possibilities. So the question is, does Saras have the same kind of spectral distortion that edges has? So this is more model independent test instead of just looking for a flat signature. And in order to do that, and this is the first time we have been able to do this in this field, which is cross correlated results from two different experiments. So we took edges data and Saras data and processed it exactly the same way. And the plot on the left here shows very oversampled residuals. Both of them are mostly thermal noise dominated. And the question was, uh, do we get similar kind of spectral distortions? And uh, sorry, I think this has not rendered well, but on the right side are the two histograms. The red histogram basically shows that what is the expectation of the cross correlation if Saras has the same kind of spectral distortion as edges. And the blue histogram shows if the spectra, sorry, the blue one shows if it's had same spectral distortions. And the red shows if the spectral distortion is not there. And again, what we find is we are consistent with zero, which means that uh, even independent of the flat profile, just the distortions themselves are not present in Saras at around 98% significance. And this basically all points out to the fact that the detection of edges in terms of its flattened profile was most likely a systematic contamination in the data and it did not really have any astrophysical or cosmological origins. And before uh, we pause, just a quick recap that, um, sorry. So a quick recap that the previous editions of Ceres themselves have placed some constraints on the absorption profile expected from cosmic dawn. And back then we were able to uh, reject around 10% of theoretically predicted models of reionization. So putting the Ceres 2 and Ceres 3 constraints together, these blue lines basically show the kind of signals that have already been ruled out by the observations. And but having said that, you can already see the gray regions that are com completely unconstrained at the moment. And that's where we are going next. So after having refuted the detection, our next step is to upgrade our receivers and deploy to more radio point locations, something that Manuri would also talk about in the later talk. And the idea is if we get uh, wider coverage in frequency and more integration time, we should 
be able to constrain these gray models here that would really bring rich astrophysical constraints of the cosmic dawn. And with that, uh, I think I'll pause and take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so any questions from those attending from Rurki, from the auditorium? We'll take those first. Yeah, hi. I just want to confirm that uh, your did, uh, predictions are saying that edges saw what it saw because of some unknown system endings. Yes. Present in their data. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Can I go ahead? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, just one more thing for request for those who are asking questions from maybe if, if it'd be good if you could also just introduce yourself, those who are asking. So I, this will facilitate interactions later also. So before, yeah, please go ahead. So we look for my team. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So uh, nice talk. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as you said that um, you're going to upgrade your receiver further. So what is the limitation with the current one? Yeah. So basically that points us to the model that we are currently adopted. So what we find here is that uh, this specific log log polynomial, we see that there are some kind of residual systematic, that means uh, more number of orders. And therefore, when we adopt that, of course we get limited by thermal noise, but that also leads to a lot of signal loss. So now the idea is target these residual systematics uh, that have not been modeled before and therefore the idea is that the, uh, the final data might need less number of orders, and therefore we would have higher sensitivity for the standard cosmological signals. You're making your band pass more, more quiet, more uh, shapeless. It is more shapeless, but uh, improving the way we are correcting for that band pass. So in the electronic in the gain chain. Yeah, in general, there are several, several stages where, where we can improve upon the band pass response and how we are correcting for that in the data. So it's a mix of both hardware improvements and analysis. But anything to do away with the leg part? Do you want to stay in the leg? Yeah, currently, yes. So currently, we are looking for uh, places in Ladakh, but quiet lakes uh, with fresh water. Uh, but that's the near term goal. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I guess we should move on to the next question. Sorry, the next talk. Uh, 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 if there are further questions, I think we're running out of time. So maybe you could ask on Slack uh, or in the online chat in the Zoom. Uh, so next is uh, Divya Jyoti. We'll talk about exploding the effects of orbital eccentricity in future detectors. So again, we are, uh, I guess, switching to compact objects now. So, so I'll give you a heads up after 10 minutes or when your talk starts, you have a total of 12 minutes and we can leave some time for questions. Yeah, okay, you can start. Yeah, please start. Hi everyone, I'm Divya Jyoti from IIT Madras and I'll be talking about the effect of orbital eccentricity in the future detectors. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with several people who are listed on the screen, uh, both from IIT Madras and uh, from Max Planck Institute. So uh, starting with the introduction that uh, over 90 gravitational wave events have been reported by the LIGO Virgo camera collaboration till now, uh, till the third transient wave catalog. And uh, these rates are only expected to increase at least by an order of magnitude uh, in the future runs as well as in the future detectors. So uh, the whole community is gearing up for these uh, uh, rates. And uh, till now, there haven't been any modeled searches for eccentric signals, partly because of a lack of uh, full IMR uh, in spiral merger ring down waveform model, which includes eccentricity. Uh, there have been many models which include uh, spins, precession, uh, and other effects, but uh, uh, various uh, groups are now giving up to develop the models which include the effect of eccentricity in addition to these existing effects. Um, 
So unmodeled searches have taken place uh, for to search for eccentric signals, but these searches mostly are efficient when the sources are um, high mass in nature because they uh, basically search for uh, small bursts in the uh, data. Um, but as far as eccentricity is concerned, um, low mass systems can show better signatures of eccentricity because uh, they have long and spiral and uh, it is in that region of the signal that uh, the effect of eccentricity is maximum. Uh, now looking at eccentric waveform, how it looks. So uh, on the right, um, the top plot, it shows a circular signal. So we can see that it, it is a, a constantly increasing amplitude and uh, in a way it, it's a clean chirp. Whereas uh, the same signal, if uh, introduced with a small eccentricity of uh, 0.1, then we see that uh, there are modulations which are introduced in the signal uh, due to this uh, introduction of eccentricity parameter. This can also be seen as an uh, envelope, uh, amplitude envelope. So on the left, uh, this envelope is plotted both for uh, circular and eccentric signal. So in blue, it's uh, showing the clean chirp, which is in the circular signal, whereas the black one shows the eccentric signal, which shows various modulations. Um, this is only for the dominant mode of gravitational wave. Now, if we introduce higher modes into this, uh, then these modulations become more and more complicated and detecting them can become even, uh, even more of a difficult task. So uh, what we did in a population study we simulated about 10,000 uh, eccentric signals, taking the uh, waveform uh, template as eccentric TV, which is basically a time domain eccentric uh, template in, in spiral regime. And uh, with these signals, we recovered them using the same waveform, which is uh, eccentric TV, and the circular counterpart of uh, this in spiral waveform, which was Taylor, Taylor T4. And uh, the idea was to study uh, if there is an eccentric population uh, for the future detectors, then how much of uh, events we are uh, going to lose if we do not include uh, eccentric models in our searches. Some of the details of this population are given uh, on the screen. For example, the mass model we took was uh, the latest one given by the third transient catalog, which is powered up the speak model. Eccentricity model was taken uh, from Zevin et al. paper instead of taking a uniform eccentricity. This is uh, supposed to be more realistic in terms of astrophysical distributions. The redshift model, again, uh, taken from uh, Medard Dickinson paper. And we have varied mass ratios all the way up to 10. And uh, uh, the detectors which were used were uh, a plus Voyager, which are uh, both 2 and 2.5G detectors, and uh, Cosmic Explorer, which is uh, the third generation detector which has been proposed. So in the results, uh, these uh, green um, histograms, they denote the injected population uh, in various parameters, for example, in total mass, uh, where the sources are supposed to be maximum in, in total mass. Similarly, for uh, chirp mass uh, distance and uh, symmetric mass ratio. So uh, this is the injected population. And then in the uh, scatter plot, one can see how this population is going to distribute in uh, eccentricity. The y-axis shows the uh, log of eccentricity. And uh, the color bar denotes the ratio of um, signals recovered with eccentricity eccentric model as compared to the circular model. So uh, the takeaway from this plot will be that um, while maximum sources will show about an increase of two times in the SNR, um, there are a few sources which can go as high as uh, eight times the SNR if we uh, use an eccentric model in the population, whereas as compared to if we only use a circular model. So this shows the, uh, the tremendous loss of events, which can be if we do not use eccentric models. Um, another way to look at this is to um, see how much of SNR is solely due to eccentricity. This can be 
uh, done by taking the difference between the circular SNR and eccentric SNR. So this difference is um, shown in this cumulative histogram. And uh, a few percentages are quoted. For example, uh, for, uh, for A+, plus, we will have uh, events which have a greater than three difference, that is uh, greater than three SNR solely due to eccentricity. So we will have about 17% uh, uh, of events with uh, such uh, differences. And uh, combining this with the uh, uh, projected detection rates, which are of the order of 10,000, um, or more, this can result in thousands of events which can be missed. Now, taking this a step further, uh, there have been some hybrids which were developed by our group at IIT Madras, and um, these hybrids are basically um, uh, stitching the PN and NR part to uh, make a, an eccentric uh, waveform. So the 3 pn accurate amplitude was taken and um, the phasing was taken from eccentric TD and then this was stitched with the uh, numerical simulations from uh, SXS catalog to construct a hybrid. This gray region here shows the matching window. And taking these hybrids, uh, some parameter estimation study was performed. So uh, these hybrids include a uh, two-to mode as well as a higher mode of gravitational radiation. And thus, we performed two studies, one with the dominant mode uh, alone, and the second one with uh, including higher modes. Uh, we used two uh, waveforms, uh, phenom XAS and phenom XHM, to recover these signals, these eccentric signals. And uh, both of these waveforms are uh, circular in nature, and uh, XAS is the two-to mode waveform, and XHM is higher mode waveform. Uh, for this study, we used uh, six uh, IDs, six eccentric IDs. So um, three of these are uh, supposed to be circular, and uh, the other three are supposed to be eccentric. And uh, these injections were performed and then recovered with circular waveform to see the biases. Uh, so uh, first, we did not introduce spins. So this is the static spin recovery. Uh, for uh, both uh, dominant and higher modes. And uh, in here, we can see that uh, the orange curves are uh, circular injections, uh, and the recovery is, of course, circular. So we can see that the injected value, which is uh, denoted by uh, the black line here, is recovered well within the 90%, whereas uh, even with a small eccentricity introduced, which is uh, 0.1, we see that the green injections, which were eccentric in nature, they are completely outside the 90% uh, interval. And uh, this is the parameter which is supposed to be uh, very well measured. Chirp mass is supposed to be the best, one of the best measured parameters in gravitational analysis. And even with chirp mass, we see that uh, the bias is um, completely outside the 90%. And hence, uh, we see that even with static spin, without introducing the spins, uh, there is still a bias at point one of eccentricity. Now, when we allow for a line spin system, then uh, we see that uh, some of the circular um, recoveries they improve. For example, for uh, for two more minutes. Uh, thank you. For uh, for q is equal to one system, the circular recovery improves, and uh, we see that this is due to the correlations between the chi-effective parameter and the chirp mass parameter as shown here. And uh, in the in uh, alliance for recovery also, we see that there are clear biases. Uh, these are some more correlations between various parameters. Uh, one thing to note here is that while the intrinsic parameters show uh, variations when an eccentric injection is recovered with circular, the same is not seen for extrinsic parameters, for example, uh, for luminosity distance and inclination. This hints at the fact that the eccentricity parameter is uh, highly correlated with intrinsic parameters, whereas not so much with the extrinsic parameters. So in summary, uh, we showed with a population study that there will be a, a significant loss of SNR and hence which will translate into significant loss of detectability of events. Uh, if there are eccentric events in the population, then uh, 
Further, we constructed uh, a few hybrids, uh, taking help from the SXS catalog for the NR uh, simulations, and uh, used them to perform uh, systematic to study systematic biases introduced in parameter estimation. And we have observed that even for an eccentricity of 0.1, uh, these biases are clearly there, and uh, these can lead to wrong results of uh, parameters such as jerk mass and other entries. Uh, thank you. I will take questions now. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the uh, audience attending online? Uh, I mean, sorry, from uh, from Rurki. So uh, please introduce yourself for asking questions for those who are attending from Rurki. Okay, so if no, uh, I have a question. Yeah, please ask. Yeah, just introduce yourself also. And, uh, uh, this is Sriharsh from TIFR uh, and NCRA. A very nice talk. So I wanted to ask uh, how much extra computation would it be to incorporate these other templates? How many parameters? Uh, I guess you add a couple of new parameters if you want to search over the eccentricity space. So is it computationally feasible? Uh, yes, you need to at least include uh, the eccentricity parameter and mean anomaly in the waveforms in order to uh, construct these. Um, but several efforts are already ongoing, and we have a few um, already. We have a few models which are uh, there on archive at least. Uh, just last month there was a paper in eccentric modeling, and. Uh, the hope is that it's not too difficult, nor too computationally expensive, and by uh, by the fourth observing run, we should have at least a few models there, or uh, to perform the eccentric parameters. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Any other questions from those in the audience? I'm from the ITPS. So, uh, so you showed that there's a lot of bias in the jerk mass, right? So for events like BW thirty nine seventy, which is like uh, designated DNS merger because of the mass. So, uh, if you recover the those with eccentric parameters, do they change? Have you done that study where you recover the values of the parameters? Um, for seventeen or seventeen, I don't think this has been done as far as I know. Uh, this was performed for a few other events uh, like fifteen or eight, uh, fifteen or nine fourteen, and um, there was one more event uh, which uh, was analyzed by Triush's group from ICDS. And uh, in those, there was uh, no signature of eccentricity found. But I guess, uh, yes, there should be, I mean, um, these events, other events can also be analyzed and uh, we can see whether they had some signatures. Okay, any other questions? Anyone from those attending on from Zoom? Uh, okay. Uh, so just one, there's a uh, question on uh, Slack, uh, uh, sorry, on the Zoom chat from for the previous speaker, Saurav. So maybe if you, if, you, if you have access to it, you could try to answer it there. So just, just a message. So uh, if there are no more questions, I think we can go to the next question. Uh, I think by uh, Mayuri Rao. Uh, I think again, we switch to cosmology now, uh, proposed... Uh, Pratyush, uh, the proposed uh, Indian lunar orbiter experiment for studying the cosmic dawn. So I'll give you, uh, I think your talk is for 12 minutes. I'll give you a heads up after 10 minutes. So from sure. the time your talk starts. Sure, thanks. Uh, can you see my slides up on the screen? Uh, I don't see it here. Okay. I just see. Let me just... Uh... Yeah. I see a thank you. Okay, now I see it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining my talk today. I'll be talking to you about Pratush, uh, which is a proposed cosmology experiment from India. The work is primarily done at uh, the Raman Research Institute. So, this is uh, somewhat a continuation of the talk that Saurabh gave just um, a while ago, but I'll quickly introduce the problem to you. So if you have a radio telescope or an antenna and point it up to the sky over the frequency range of say 50 to 200 megahertz, what you might see is a spectrum that looks like this. So you have brightness temperature on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. And I want you to note a couple of things on this slide, namely the amplitude, which is uh, say several hundred of uh, Kelvin in brightness temperature units. And, the, uh, and uh, the, the shape 
is quite smooth uh, and smooth we will quantify later but visually uh, you feel intuitively this is like a smooth uh, signal now it is expected that the signature of the formation of the very first stars and galaxies in the universe and their following interaction with the neutral hydrogen content in the universe results in something that looks like this so there is a forest of lines shown here as predicted by standard cosmology but the true signal could be any one of these or something somewhat different uh, and the thing to note again on the x and y axis in x axis is the differential by brightness temperature so this is a uh, temperature contrast against the uh, spectrum the cosmic microwave background radiation uh, and the amplitude is very weak uh, at the most it's about 215 millikelvin in absorption and uh, the other distinguishing feature is that all of these signals have some kind of interesting shapes uh, in the spectrum and the idea is that if you measure the true signal uh, which is probably one of this or something else and you work backwards uh, you should be able to work out the astrophysics and the cosmology of this period of cosmic dawn and epoch of reionization so every uh, turning point in the signal and its amplitude denotes uh, some meaningful astrophysics that you would want to uh, interpret so we need to detect this extremely weak signal from uh, buried within this extremely bright foreground signal so this is the challenge that nature poses to us so this is an astrophysical challenge that you cannot avoid no matter where you go or what you do however there are other challenges to detecting such a signal uh, with a real experiment and i have highlighted just a few of these and this is evident also from the talks uh, given by uh, bloop and sorab earlier where they use the phrase systematics uh, quite frequently and i'm going to try to tell you what some of these systematics can be so highlighted in uh, pink are some of the systematics that you will see or that you will have to work around or uh, include uh, in any experiment that you um, uh, deploy and uh, this could be uh, experiment that is in ground in space on water does not matter so some of these are that when you have an antenna and the antenna has a beam if the antenna beam is not perfectly still as a function of frequency and kind of wobbles around as a function of frequency effectively what you might see is that you are looking at a different slightly different direction of the sky as a function of frequency so and if the sky brightness is not uniform spatially you are introducing structure from the sky so in a spatial domain into your frequency domain similarly you could have standing waves or reflections in your cables you could have self generated radio frequency interference you could have limitations uh, or um, artifacts of your data analysis method so these are just a few in addition to this if you are uh, observing for this signal from anywhere on earth you have three primary problems uh, starting with radio frequency interference so this is man made interference particularly in the form of fm radio signals that are especially a nuisance in this band uh, in addition to this you have effects of the ionosphere where the ionosphere itself can emit uh, radiation it can cause refractive effects and finally you come to the coupling of the receiver with its uh, medium so for example sort of mentioned that one of the motivations for going from earth or land onto water is that uh, earth is not homogeneous in its structure so there are rocks and soil and pebble and you move to a more homogeneous medium like a lake but even then you have to remember that you are always operating in an environment where there's a lot of structure in the near field of your antenna so ultimately an experiment that you want to design uh, to detect the signal with high confidence should either factor in all of these things as part of its design or at the very least is despite of all of these issues you do not want your instrument to introduce any confusing shapes that will limit your uh, signal detection confidence and uh, oh sorry about that um but the way it's rendered up here but basically that's why we have, we were motivated to uh, propose this experiment called pratush and uh, pratush uh, in case many of you didn't know in sanskrit means pratyush means dawn or the sun which is a fitting name for a cosmology experiment looking to detect this signal 
Uh, Pratush stands for probing deionization of the universe using signal from hydrogen. Yes, an acronym that was also kind of made to fit this meaningful word. Uh, but uh, so Pratush uh, in its complete phase will operate from 40 to 200 megahertz. But today I'll be presenting to you the baseline design of Pratush, uh, which will operate from 55 to 110 megahertz. And in its final form, Pratush will be a lunar orbiter. So it will go around the moon and when on the far side of the moon, uh, it will make scientific observations. And when it is on the near side looking at Earth, it will download the data back to ground station. And uh, Saurabh has already given the talk on the ground-based experiments, Saras and the results where, uh, that we've had from that recently. And so those who have missed it can please catch that. Um, so after completing just over two years in this seed funding stage, Pratush has been recommended by an ISRO appointed committee to proceed to project more. So we are working towards writing up a proposal for the same. So let me look at the, the motivation for going to the moon. So I'll go back to this previous slide. Um, so ideally you want to operate in an environment where you don't have ionosphere. So you want to go above the ionosphere. So that could be anywhere in space. Uh, but you also want to be operating um, where there is minimal radio frequency interference. So you want to go to a place where there is very little or no RFI. And one such place uh, is identified to be the far side of the moon. So the side of the moon that you do not see. But then again, you can ask, do I want a lander or an orbiter? And here we have made a choice that we want an orbiter because once again, when you have a lander, you have these other issues of being in the near field environment of the terrain of the moon itself. Hence, we go for an orbiter. So that is the motivation for Pratush being a lunar far side orbiter experiment. So what is the design philosophy of Pratush? Much like most of the experiments in our lab, including the SARS series of experiments, the design philosophy is that we do not want the instrument itself to be introducing any confusing shapes in the spectrum we measure. So that is the basic goal of everything that we design. Okay, But here there's a fundamental difference between the way Pratush and Saras is designed to operate. While in uh, Saras, you have an antenna with some electronics and a long 100 meter long optical fiber cable, which connects this antenna to a digital receiver. In space, we can't afford to do this because of practical reasons. So we decided to tackle this challenge head on and we are putting all the electronics, including the satellite electronics, payload electronics within the satellite package and the antenna sits right on top of all of this. So that is the design difference in terms of the construction. In addition to this, we have also taken uh, into cognizance that uh, when you are in space, you cannot go and tweak your antenna and move things around and iterate in your measurements. So we want as many measurables as possible about how your receiver performs. So we have also incorporated in um, Pratush a vector network analyzer, which basically measures the antenna return loss in situ in its operating conditions. So we also have that metadata when we are doing our data analysis further on. So here is uh, the concept diagram of uh, Pratush, where you have an antenna, uh, which is a somewhat non-traditional looking antenna. So it is a cone over a profile reflector. So we call this as a monocone antenna. And uh, beneath this profile reflector is the satellite uh, craft or the bus, which houses the analog electronics, digital electronics of Pratush, in addition to spacecraft electronics. And this entire structure uh, is uh, EMI shielded, and I'll come to that in a bit, so that you are not affected by self-generated RFI. And uh, you can note that this uh, reflector that is shown as a somewhat solid structure, uh, it's not quite solid. It is uh, optically transparent in the sense that you may have a mesh or a bunch of spokes such that uh, you, uh, it will allow solar radiation or sunlight to penetrate through it. So that when the, this entire structure is orbiting around the moon, whenever it does see sunlight, this sunlight can illuminate the side panels of this rectangular box beneath it, where the solar panels are housed. One minute. Sure. So um, this is uh, the, I'll quickly walk through some of the uh, simulations as well as the results we're already seeing from the ground-based testing of Pratush. So here is again the antenna design, and we have paid a lot of attention to the antenna beam pattern as well as the antenna return loss. And we have a pipeline that we have developed 
through which we pass a sky model as well as the antenna properties to ensure that there are no confusing structures introduced by the antenna design that might uh, uh, affect the signal detection confidence. Uh, we have an um, analog receiver architecture, which is very similar to the um, SARAS architecture. But in addition to the bandpass calibration scheme that uh, Saurabh has already presented, we also have a vector network analyzer that we are building somewhat from first principles um, so that we can also implement this using space-based electronics. I'm also flashing pictures of the ground-based concept model that we are currently building alongside. And uh, this is the digital receiver, which is again, um, which has legacy from the ground-based experiment counterpart, but we will be uh, going for more uh, high technology readiness level, space-based uh, counterpart uh, components. And in, a, in addition to all of the um, FPGA-based electronics, we will also have a lot of onboard processing using a single board computer so that we are not limited by data rate restrictions when we download. So we can do as much as online processing as possible. So here are some nice pictures. So this is the concept model of uh, Pratush. So this is with all ground-based components. The idea being that we will demonstrate the concept of this entire experiment on the ground, being able to see the rise and the fall of the galactic uh, synchrotron radiation as a function of LST. Uh, here are some um, preliminary results of our measurements of the analog receiver. And we have also started making incorporating some design changes in the components we use in the analog receiver so that uh, we have options for somewhat high technology readiness level components to use for Pratush. Um, and uh, here are again some results using a Raspberry Pi acquired uh, data uh, from our digital receiver. So we have swapped out a laptop that is sits in the ground-based experiment, and we're doing as much as possible in as light, uh, lightweight a way as possible. So what's next for Pratush is that the biggest R&D challenge for us is the EMI shielding. Because if you go all the way- Mayuri, the far, could you wrap up? Sure, this is my last slide. Uh, so if you go all the way to the far side of the moon, uh, because to avoid terrestrial RFI, but you're limited by your own self-generated RFI, that's no fun. So we are now working with a, a industry partner to identify and develop a lightweight um, high EMI shielding enclosure. And we are currently uh, working on that. That's our current biggest challenge. We're also working closely with uh, members from ISRO for some technical uh, doubts and consultation that we will need inputs on. And finally, subject to approval, we will move from lab model to the engineering model and finally a flight model. So I'll leave, a, leave you with a slide of all the members who have been involved uh, as part of this project and several others whose pictures we couldn't fit on here. Um, that's all from me and I'll take questions. Thank you. So again, questions first uh, from those um, attending it physically from Ruruki. Again, please introduce yourself also before asking the question. So any questions from the floor there? Yes. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead, yeah. Hi, Mary. This is Shriharsh. Okay. Uh, very nice talk. So, uh, one of the questions is, you know, if you go to lunar, getting to lunar orbit is obviously much harder and uh, it's much easier to get into LEO. So, if you are, say, above the Pacific Ocean, uh, how much of this, uh, how, how, how much worse is it compared to being on the ground or uh, or behind the moon? Right. Uh, great question. Uh, we are actually working on this. So we have a student who's uh, presented a talk also at ASI recently. Um, so we have a simulation that we have set up of predicting RFI in orbit around Earth and seeing how bad things can be. So you gain in terms of uh, path loss. So you see lesser power, but you also see a larger amount of uh, power because you're high above the Earth. Uh, we don't quite have the results yet, but the idea is that we will have a pipeline that will help us identify at least the least RFI contaminated orbits for a low Earth orbit mission. And that is the plan. So Pratush will attempt a first phase of low Earth orbiter uh, for some preliminary results in a favorable orbit with minimal RFI and then go to the moon. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? From those uh, in Ruki, okay. Any questions from those attending online? Don't see any. 
Okay, so I guess if people have, uh, if there are no more questions from Rurki, uh, then uh, 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 you can ask for the questions on Slack. Uh, so let's thank Mayuri again for a nice talk. Uh, so we'll go to the next talk. Mukesh Kumar Singh will talk, uh, tell us about improved uh, uh, early warning estimates of luminosity distance and orbital inclination of compact object mergers. Yeah. So, uh, so please take it away. I will again uh, give you a, a heads up after 10 minutes. You have a total of 12 minutes. Okay. So, yeah, please, please take it away. Mukesh. I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you for um, attending this talk here. So I'm Mukesh Kumar Singh. I'm a PhD student at uh, ICTS TFI Bangalore. And I will be talking about improved early warning estimates of extrinsic parameters of compact binary mergers using higher modes of gravitational radiation. So apology that I've changed the title a little bit. Not able to change slides. Yeah, so just a little bit introduction that uh, gravitational waves are, uh, is a new window of astronomy to study the universe, invisible through electromagnetic observations. And the most strongest uh, sources which are known to, uh, to us are binary black hole, binary neutral star, and neutron star black hole mergers, uh, etc. Until now, over 90 detections have been uh, made for CVCs, including the EM counterpart from one of the VNS, one of the two VNS mergers detected. And the expectation is that uh, in the next couple of years, uh, of the order of thousand events will be uh, detected. Now, just not only detecting the uh, GW signals, but we can also do multi messenger astronomy. So, uh, if we, so the first detection of EM emission from the multi messenger follow up of the GW signal from BNS merger, which was uh, detected on 17 August 2017, it clearly maximized the science. Uh, just, to, just for example, that it uh, pointed out that the sites for heavy element formation and also uh, pointed that the BNS mergers are our engine of uh, for the emission of FRVs, uh, sorry, GRVs. And uh, so, and et cetera, there were many more uh, science gain. But in this case, the pre-merger and early warning GW detection and localization alert got delayed by uh, 30 minutes, which might have uh, led to the missing of detection of EM emission prior to the merger or any information about any intermediate merger product. So the ideally the alerts must be reported before the onset of EM counterpart. This can help EM astronomers to uh, slew their telescopes uh, to the source location to capture any, any EM uh, emission and setting light on the complex physics of merger and post-merger uh, phases of the compact binary. Now, just to give an overview, what current early warning looks like. Current early warning uh, target is targeted to uh, BNS-like mergers, which are near symmetric in masses and also not very heavy. And also al always uh, expected to produce EM counterpart, uh, which is termed as EM pride. So in the right-hand side, the in the cartoon, uh, I have shown the duration of the various signals detected by uh, LIGO. Uh, in the bottom, you see the three seconds of the signal duration for the BNS merger although it lasted for around like three minutes uh, in the detector's frequency event. So you can see the other BBS signals uh, are shorter in time because they're heavier as compared to VNS uh, mergers. So we will get relatively more time for doing early warning uh, with um, like VNS mergers, but what about the early warning for heavier systems like for example, Newton star black hole mergers. So, now, the first question to ask will be whether it will be worth doing uh, any early warning for NSPS mergers. So, NSPS systems could be M right if the tidal disruption happens outside the innermost stable circular orbit, which is scope. It mainly depends on two parameters, uh, two, two factors. One is the equation of the state of Newton star, how easily it is uh, disruptible. And the second one is the spin of the black hole in the, in the binary. 
So the large spin will reduce the scope, increasing the chances of tidal disruption at a relatively smaller binary separation. But since the NSP systems uh, are heavier than BNSs, they have a smaller inbound duration, providing a relatively smaller window for uh, early morning as compared to BNSs. So the question to ask is, is it possible to increase the time within this window? So answer is yes, using uh, higher modes of uh, GW radiation. So just to give an overview of how the radiation emitted from a compact binary merger looks like. So you can, like, uh, you can write as multiple expansion where each multipole HLM is a function of time and intrusive parameters of the binary, uh, which are component masses and component spins. And then uh, there's a factor of spherical harmonic, which, is, which captures the angular dependence of the source with respect to the uh, observer. And this amplitude is scaled by the luminosity distance. So these, the, the extrinsic parameter set comprises of uh, luminosity distance, inclination, and initial phase and sky location of the source, which might be interesting for the for EM astronomers if there's an EM counterpart in the merger. So the dominant contribution comes from the quadruple mode, which corresponds to L equal to 2 and M equal to uh, plus minus 2. The higher modes contribution uh, corresponding to L greater than 2 is only important for sources with uh, asymmetries with high asymmetries, for example, high mass ratios and non-optimal orientations. So how higher modes can help us? Because they, are, they, they enter early in the detector's uh, frequency band. Uh, just to give an idea, so non -processing, for non-processing binaries, uh, the, the frequency at which higher multiples oscillate are just multiples of the orbital frequency, and hence increasing the time duration in the, in the detector's frequency band. So as you can see on the right hand side, the 44 mode enters early in the detector frequency uh, sensitivity band, then the 33, then and 33 uh, before 22. So detecting these higher modes before the before the dominant mode, which is the 22 mode, uh, we can do early warning and localize the source prior to the uh, well prior to the merger. So just to demonstrate the early warning with the higher modes, we choose a fiducial system of mass M1 with 15 solar mass and M2 1.5 and the inclined system at 60 degree and located at 40 megaparsec. We choose optimal sky location that maximizes the sky area. And we choose o O5 uh, sensitivity, which is A plus sensitivities of LIGO vibo kagra detectors, a detector of five detector network. Uh, so on the plot right hand side, we saw the sky area evolution as a function of time to coalescence. And the color bar shows the SNR as a function of uh, time to coalescence. And uh, the squares in the circle corresponds to higher modes plus 2, 2 and the only dominant mode. What you see that at a given early morning time, higher modes provide you uh, consistently smaller sky areas and uh, larger SNRs, which was the aim for early warning. Now, Going a little more general, that we do sky location with optimized population. So we keep the parameters as this as the previous case, but we change in the mass mass parameter, basically corresponding to uh, component masses corresponding to neutron star black hole uh, binaries. And the color bar here, uh, if you focus on the leftmost plot, the color bar represents the sky area localized using higher modes uh, apart from the dominant mode. And the contours here. Uh, Contours here represent the, or demarcate the reasons of EM bright binaries uh, for different values of uh, spin of the black hole in the binary. So, uh, and the middle plot uh, shows the improvements with the inclusion of higher modes as compared to the dominant mode. And what you see that th there's a factor of three to four improvement in the localized sky area at 90% confidence, 45 seconds before the merger with the inclusion of higher modes. In the left, in the rightmost plot, you uh, we actually look at the early morning when we fix the we fix the sky localization, let's say hundred square uh, thousand square degree, and we ask the question how much uh, early warning you will be gaining uh, when you include higher modes. So in this case, you get maximum early warning time of uh, twenty six seconds, which is a uh, prop approximate slow time for uh, telescopes of the order of from thirty seconds to minutes. We do this and uh, we do the same analysis for the Voyager scenario, which are the second generation detectors uh, with sensitivities improved by a factor of uh, three to uh, two to three. And in this case, we get a factor of improvement five to six and a maximum early warning time of 40 seconds for a fiducial uh, localization sky of thousand square degree. 
Now we do a population uh, study here. We uh, inject or we consider 55,000, uh, approximately 55,000 NSPS mergers located up to a limiting distance of 100 megaparsec and distribute them uniformly in sky locations. And we consider the non-zero remnant mass in the merger as the, as the proxy for the EM write of the and we choose here two uh, spin distributions for the binary. One is isotropic, another is uh, aligned spin distribution. And uh, what we find that the, for aligned spin distribution, um, the, there's a more fraction of uh, EM binaries, uh, EM write uh, systems as compared to the isotropic one, which is evident because for the aligned spin, the component of the black hole will be larger, hence uh, giving more chances of uh, providing more chances of. Um, uh, tidal disruption uh, happening outside the scope. And what we see here, if you focus on the right hand side panel, uh, the first one is for O5 scenario, then the bottom one is for Voyager scenario. What you see that the localized sky reduction factor is greater than uh, by two, is, is greater by 20% 20, 20 for the aligned spin and uh, as compared to the isotropic spin. And uh, this there's a band of, uh, or if you look at one of the curve, there is a band width. And this width corresponds to the variation in the equation of state. So this variation is at max of two more minutes you have. Okay, thank you. So this width, this width is uh, only varying by 10% uh, due to the variation in, in the equation of state. And uh, we also look at the number of galaxies localization. So basically uh, combining the distance estimates in early warning with the sky localization and uh, what we see, so we, can, we consider here three observing scenarios. Uh, one is O5, then Voyager, and then 3G, which are third generation detectors, uh, which having sensitivities uh, improved by, by, an, by an order of magnitude. And uh, what we see that the improvement in the number of galaxies with the inclusion of higher modes is a factor of maximum factor of 2.5 uh, for O5 and a factor of four for uh, Voyager at 45 seconds before the merger. And this improvement factor uh, is a maximum factor of 10 for third generation detectors. Even if you look at the early warning time of 300 seconds, which is, um, uh, and all these systems are located here at 100 megaparsec. So just to summarize uh, that significant improvements uh, in sky localization, in, as well as the number of galaxies localized due to the inclusion of higher modes in, in early warning time. Uh, which will be quite interesting for, for EM astronomers to for the follow-up of the source. And uh, higher modes may provide significant improvements, but these may not uh, always result in tight sky areas or number of galaxies uh, localized. In that case, uh, sky areas of the order of like 100 square degree may be covered by a joint effort involving multiple telescopes, especially if assisted by a uh, galaxy catalog. Uh, we can also think of uh, some an optimal setup where the evolving and sinking uh, GW sky maps are continuously uh, being streamed to automated telescopes. And uh, also the improved measurements of distance and orientation can help uh, EM ast uh, astronomers to better determine their follow-up strategies. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you uh, very much uh, for the nice talk. So any questions first uh, from those in, uh, in the audience? I am Arun. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So you, when you give the trigger, right? When you get the trigger, do we already have pipeline that just will, like, uh, what is it? Uh, will sort of point out triggers on the move? Like, if yeah. you have signals coming in, data coming in, will you be able to get it at that instant? Do we yes. Have yes, there are various pipelines. Uh, and and second part of this question, uh, the question is. How many false triggers do, do you expect? Because we cannot afford to annoy the EM astronomers, right? You cannot keep on saying that we have a trigger, we have a trigger, and we don't have a trigger, right? So, I yeah. mean, uh, what is the false uh, false alarm probability well, that you are seeing? Yeah, that is something dependent on the, the kind of SNR test would you choose. So, uh, for example, different pipelines have different false alarm rates. And uh, the most promising pipelines, which turns out to be uh, is the GST lab, which basically used the template uh, for the theoretically predicted signal and matches with the data. So there's always uh, some chances that uh, at the end you will uh, the trigger might be uh, some noise artifact. Uh, 
Okay, but uh, what percentage? So is it one? Oh, I'm not sure about the percentage. Oh. Sorry. All right, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so if not, uh, let's thank the speaker again for a nice talk. And then I think we go to our last talk. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so please share your screen. Uh, um, can I share my screen? Yeah, so I'll. Yeah, so the last talk was by Saurav Paul. We'll talk about H1 intensity mapping with Meerkat interferometer. So I guess uh, uh, I, hopefully the organizers can. Yeah, so I see your screen. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, so please take it away, Saurav. So again, I'll give you a heads up after 10 minutes, and then uh, you have a total of 12 minutes, and we can leave some time for discussion. Okay. okay. Thanks. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Saurav. I'm currently a research associate at the McGill University and uh, my primary research area is 21 centimeter cosmology. In particular, I study how the current and the next generation of uh, radio telescopes such as Meerkat, Square Kilometer Array, Chime and Cord will be able to address the fundamental question in cosmology with the intensity mapping technique. And in today's talk, I'm going to talk about um, the current, the work that I have been doing for some time. Um, so it's uh, the intensity mapping with the meerkat in the interferometric mode. So, um, so the big picture in the observational cosmology we're trying to address is to understand how the matter, the matter is distributed throughout the universe and uh, what the cosmic time. Um, and this uh, picture shows like uh, how, uh, how much we know about it and how much we don't. So in the furthest corner, we have the cosmic micro background and in the local universe, we have these uh, traces, uh, various traces such as galaxies and quasars in this conical shape. Uh, but one thing uh, you will uh, definitely notice is that much of these, uh, much of the volume of this observable universe is still unexplored to us because uh, detecting galaxies at higher at higher at ship uh, gets increasingly difficult. So uh, we are yet to explore um, the main, much of the volume of the universe is still um, unexplored to us. But uh, uh, there, there, is a, there is a common element, which is neutral hydrogen, which is present from the recombination epoch to the local universe. So uh, we, the people in the 21 centimeter cosmology community think that uh, by detecting this uh, 21 centimeter emission uh, at various epochs or at various redshift, we can uh, uh, we can understand we can uh, uh, explore this uh, uh, this unexplored territories uh, further and we can understand the underlying matter distribution and that's uh, uh, where this intensity mapping technique with the 10 to 20 centimeter line emission uh, comes into the picture so this is uh, a brief schematic how the concept uh, of uh, intensity mapping works so you can uh, think of a galaxy distribution uh, this by these points so the idea of the 20 centimeter intensity mapping is to uh, make a map of uh, this uh, distribution, the 20 centimeter uh, uh, emission map. And we are not really trying to make uh, like a very high resolution map. So the idea is to ma make uh, like a very low angular resolution map so that each resolution element can contain many galaxies and the collective emission of them can boost the signal. And by uh, making this uh, sort of bloody uh, image of this 20 centimeter emission, we can uh, we can uh, uh, get many information of the of the underlying matter distribution, and we can uh, get access to those various cosmological scales of interest. So, uh, uh, so this is a, a much promising uh, tracer compared to the other galaxy surveys because if the number counts of those galaxies are steep and survey depth is shallow. And uh, as uh, the frequency of observation uh, is corresponds to the redshift, we can uh, have a high redshift resolution from uh, from this kind of observation. And this kind of uh, uh, technique uh, is generally less time consuming from a spectroscopic galaxy survey, which requires a very high uh, sensitivity to detect each individual galaxy. So, um, so why we chose we have chosen the I mean how why the Meerkat radio telescope is a good instrument to uh, do this kind of experiment. So just a, a brief overview of uh, Meerkat. So it's a 64 dish array at, uh, the, at uh, the South Africa. So it is uh, currently managed by Sarao. 
And each dish has a, a diameter of 13.5 meter and the central core region of one kilometer that houses about 48 antennas. So this gives us uh, access to many short baselines and the short baseline uh, translates to lower K perpendicular mode that I'll show in the next slide. And by having this many short baseline uh, boost the sensitivity at low K perpendicular mode. And currently it's operating in the L band range uh, that is 856 to 1720 megahertz. And, uh, uh, and there are two uh, 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 interferometric, uh, sorry, two intensity mapping, uh, in intensity mapping experiments that is going on with the Meerkat. One is with the single dish mode. So in the single dish mode, we, the idea is to steer uh, all 64 dishes and survey the sky, a large area of the sky. And, uh, and uh, that will give us access to very small K modes. Uh, but uh, in the single dish mode, we are uh, restricted by the primary beam of the each 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 dish because we cannot uh, get uh, the in the single dish mode, it cannot resolve the structures uh, smaller than the primary beam size. That's where the interferometric mode comes into the picture. So in the interferometric mode, we are trying to uh, use the data from uh, some well-known projects uh, that is going on with Meerkat, such as MIT and Laduma. So uh, what we're trying to do is use the data from this project uh, as single pointing uh, uh, deep observation of, this, uh, uh, of these fields and uh, trying to uh, uh, make a statistical detection of H H1 from these observations. So in terms of the scales, which scales are, um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, which scales are observed with these uh, two modes are shown in the right, right hand diagram. So this, this is a 2D uh, space K parallel K perpendicular. Uh, so in the, in the interferometric mode, uh, we, are, we are going to quasi-linear to non-linear regime. And in terms of the 1D power spectrum, this shows the what kind of scales uh, we, are, we are expected to see from the interferometric mode. So it really uh, is a complementary to the single dish. So by combining the two, we can have a wide range of K values that can be accessed uh, uh, with the Meerkat, in, Meerkat instrument. So uh, this, uh, this slide shows uh, like with an interferometric set of what, uh, what kind of K modes that, that we're expected to see. So, uh, I mean, this holds true for any kind of uh, uh, radio telescope array. So it, may, it can be a dish uh, telescope or a collection of dipoles. So if, if we have a, if we have a collection of antennas, uh, it will have uh, a, a range of baselines starting from the shortest baseline to some say longest baselines. So a short baseline is sensitive to, sensitive to a large angle in the sky, and that translates to very low K perpendicular at the, at the Fourier domain, uh, shown by this red line. And uh, if we have a long baseline that is uh, sensitive to a very small angle in the sky, and we thereby get uh, uh, access to a high K perpendicular. And in the, in the K parallel domain, which is along the line of sight, so the lower limit of this K parallel is uh, given by the uh, bandwidth of the observation, which again translates to the co-moving depth of the observation. And the higher limit, upper limit of the K parallel is uh, given by the channel width. So this uh, slide roughly shows uh, what are the K mode uh, 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 are accessible to us given an uh, interferometric et cetera. And how we go from uh, interferometric observation to the power spectrum or the statistical detection is shown here. So the primary observable uh, of an uh, radio interferometric array is, uh, is the visibility, which, uh, uh, which uh, is, uh, measures the spatial correlation of electric field from the sky. And if we take one visibility measurement uh, for, from, from a particular baseline and uh, do a Fourier transform along the frequency, we go to the delay domain. So for each uh, measurement in this UV uh, tau, that is the delay domain, we can construct a power spectrum uh, in the KX, KY, and K parallel domain. So just by squaring it, um, simplified version, just by squaring it and with some other normalization constants, the full equation is shown below. And uh, the KX and KY, uh, these are on, uh, are on the plane of the sky and K parallel is along the line of sight. And the uh, relation between the U to KX, uh, V to KY and Tau to K, K parallel is shown in, the, in this box. So how this uh, uh, approach works. So let's say we have the Meerkat array. Uh, it observes a real space volume in the sky. At, at, at a co-moving distance r that is given by the, uh, the, uh, the uh, center of the frequency band that we are, we, we are taking and the delta r that is the, the bandwidth. And from this observation, we can construct a 3D cylindrical volume in the KX, KY and K parallel domain. 
And further, we can average this kx and ky uh, along the, on the plane of the sky to form a single k perpendicular axis and show our power spectrum as a 2D power spectrum in the k parallel k perpendicular domain. Or we can do a spherical averaging by kx, ky, and k parallel and to form a single k, k axis. And uh, we can, uh, we can uh, show our power spectrum as a 1D power spectrum that is pk versus k. So that's the uh, basic schematic of our uh, interferometric uh, 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 intensity mapping approach. So the first thing we wanted to try is that how good is Meerkat as an interferometer to do this kind of thing? And what are the challenges we can we expect to uh, see uh, uh, in, this, in, this, in this approach? The first thing we tried to pick some data from the MITRE project. So we, we took some data from the Cosmos field, approximately 11 hours of data. And we simulated uh, the visibilities. So for each, uh, we, we took the baseline distribution from the data and for each baseline, we uh, generated uh, the visibility. So the visibility has three main components, the H1 model, thermal noise, and the foreground. For the H1 and the thermal no noise, we generated per baseline. And for the foreground component, we actually made a map of the map from the data and we took the models, the, uh, the foreground, the point source distribution from the image to make our foreground. So we have all three, all these three components, and this is the power the two D power spectrum of all these three components look like. So on the left we have this nice H one H one power spectrum, uh, the two D power spectrum, and you can see the isotropic distribution. Um, and things starts to get interesting. Two more minutes. We, yes. Okay. We we include uh, the thermal noise into the picture, and you can see that the H one is completely buried over under the thermal noise. And um, and the, and the, and you can see that we have a very high sensitivity at the k perpendicular because we have lots of short short baselines, but it kind of the noise increases because uh, the baseline density uh, decreases as we go to higher baseline. And when you include the foreground, we get this foreground wedge shape because the foreground is uh, spectrally smooth. H1 and thermal noise is on the other hand is not. So our approach is to take the foreground avoidance approach, uh, and we just uh, don't include these K modes at all when we, uh, when we do the final uh, post spectrum calculation. And um, this uh, shows the comparison between the simulation and the real data set because we all also have the uh, real data. So in terms of the foreground isolation, they are in good match. And also in the thermal noise at higher K parallel, uh, we see good match. But in the real data, we also see some of the contaminations so we, which we have identified now, which, which, are, which antennas or which baselines are uh, contributing to that and we are able to flag them. So, uh, so the thing that we wanted to see what kind of constraints we can put on the H1 power spectrum, and we uh, we took multiple realization, thousand uh, approximately thousand realization for uh, various observing durations, and uh, this uh, plot shows what kind of uh, constraints we can put on the H1 power spectrum with the various uh, duration observation. And we also wanted to focus uh, what would be uh, what would happen if we use the full MIT data. So the full MIT data will have four uh, well-known fields, approximately 20 square degree sky coverage, and thousand hours of observation time. And we have we we expect to get a signal to noise ratio of more than seven at uh, k 0.5 approximately megabar second burst. So this work shows gives us a confidence that approximately 100 hours of observation with the Meerkat data, we can get a very good constraint on the H1 uh, power spectrum. So with that in mind, we are uh, currently working on um, analyzing approximately 100 hours of observation, single pointing uh, data with the Meerkat. And we, we have the simulation pipeline and also the uh, power spectrum pipeline uh, to calculate the, the, the power spectrum from the data. And this uh, is a is a uh, is a glimpse of the the result that we are getting from uh, from this analysis. From the left, we are uh, you see you are seeing the two D power spectrum from the Sorry, side. Time is up. If you'd like to please okay, try to I'm conclude soon. Yeah, sure, sure. And uh, the one on the right is shows the once uh, relation of the simulation, and they are in good match with each other. Uh, so to conclude, we have uh, we have uh, uh, we have made our intensity mapping pipeline to calculate power spectrum from Meerkat data, and we can show that we can get useful constraint from uh, uh, analysis of uh, uh, approximately 100 hours of data. And uh, our ongoing work is uh, with uh, we have, we are we're currently working on uh, analy analyzing 100 hours of single pointing of observation at two redshifts. And in the future, we'll try to do cross correlation with Galaxy Survey with uh, where some well-known fields, like example, Cosmos. And our final goal will be to do intensity mapping with a full mighty survey. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Saurav for a nice talk.
So questions from the uh, floor, those in Rurki. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, hi, sir. This is another sort of from Arare. Okay, yeah, hi. Hi. Yeah, so the question is uh, exactly on this plot. That is, uh, this is foreground avoidance power spectrum. So, what kind of delay thresholds do you have, and does it depend on the baselines that, that have gone into this? Um, so, uh, if I understand your question correctly, uh, you're saying, uh, are, we, uh, are we avoiding the foregrounds? Is it? Is it yeah. Your question? yeah, so uh, for to get to this uh, plot, we have taken this like uh, line, which is the horizon boundary of the foreground. So we are including the modes which are above this line. So, so we are taking very conservative approach because in plot, we, we can see, you can see that the foregrounds are like much below this line, but we are still taking this conservative approach because there, there are foreground leakages which happens at high, longer baselines, but uh, which mean we, we, we are not able to see in this plot because thermal noise dominance. But uh, to uh, get this 1D plot, we have uh, taken only the modes above this uh, horizon line. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I guess we are almost 10 minutes past the time. So let's thank Saurav and also all the speakers for very really nice. Oh, sure. Okay, okay, please, please. Please, please be quick. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Saurav. Uh, so, anything about polarization with Meerkat? I'm sorry, I, I didn't I quite hear. about polarization with Meerkat? Uh, uh, so, we have done polarization calibration also. Uh, is that what you're asking? Yeah, so what, how does the polarized foregrounds uh, behave? I okay, think. so uh, we have uh, we have separately estimated the power spectrum from all uh, four Stokes parameter, and we don't do not see much uh, of the leakage. If that's what you are asking, yeah, yeah. Okay, so beam is not not at a significant level that will uh, that will uh, like contaminate our uh, power spectrum estimation. So beam is very well behaved in some sense. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a really good instrument, and uh, I mean the data quality is also fantastic. So yeah, I mean uh, like our our results are really matching with the simulations. Oh, thanks, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, Saurav, uh, and thanks to all the speakers for very nice talks and keeping on time. Uh, I'm sure there are more questions also, uh, but uh, we can. Uh, 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 we can have those on Slack. Uh, and uh, so if there are further questions, I think you can just ask them on Slack. And I think the, as I understand, this talks will also be uploaded on YouTube soon. So you can watch them at your leisure. So, uh, uh, so that's all from me. So I'll hand it over to the local organizers in case they want to make any announcements or something.